Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. Our literary lookbook is a list of 182 books releasing from January to May 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today, Kelly Hooker returns to chat with me about our favorite books of 2023. Kelly is an avid reader, reviewer, and bookstagrammer. She works very part-time as a speech pathologist in Michigan and has three toddler boys. As a result, she firmly believes that nap time is for novels. She is an audiobook enthusiast and loves hosting her signature chapters and chats. She creates seasonal reading guides to help readers pick up the right book at the right time. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Kelly. How are you today? I am doing good. I'm just watching the snow fall outside. I just opened the window. <laughs> oh my gosh. How are you doing? I'm good. I can't believe it's snowing there, though. Actually, it is colder than it has been here in a while. It's in the 40s, which for Houston this time of year is a little chilly. Yeah, it's really coming down outside. <laughs> not not ready for that. I bet. <laughs> well, we are talking today about our favorite reads of 2023. And these episodes, the year-end roundup ones are always my favorite. I don't know what it is about it, but reflecting on the entire year, what you loved, what I loved, where we overlap, all of it is so much fun. I totally agree. It's really a great exercise for me to go back and see which books that I thought were going to be in the top 10, 15, and then maybe worked their way out and which ones really stuck around. I just love looking back. It is really interesting to do that. And also for me to reflect back on our quarterly sessions and then see what's no longer on your list as well as what's no longer on my list. Yes, yes. That was really fun for me as I was getting my notes together too. I'm like, oh, this one's got to go. <laughs> It's hard. I really had a hard time getting to 15. And as I was assembling all my notes for this episode, I was like, oh, yeah, I really like that one, too. Oh, I really like that one, too. So I thought I could have talked about 15 more books, I think. Oh, easily. Well, what's been going on with you? Did you guys have a nice Thanksgiving? We did. We did. We're on the tail end of Luke's tonsillectomy recovery. And that was a solid two weeks of um, it was a lot. <laughs> So it feels good to be able to get back to normal life a little bit and also just really get back into my reading. It was tricky the last few weeks. That's hard. And I'm glad that he is feeling better and that that all went smoothly. Yeah, me too. How about you? Good. Michael and I celebrated our 25th anniversary early because it will be in February. But we went to London right before Thanksgiving and got back the day before Thanksgiving. And so we had such a nice time. It was just really wonderful. We went to a bunch of bookstores. I think the one in Oxford, Blackwell's was my favorite, but it was really fun to be over there and celebrate. Happy anniversary. And that looked like just the perfect way to celebrate and get away. 
Yeah, we had a really nice time. I'm so glad. What are you currently reading? I am just starting Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame, and it's a debut by Olivia Ford. And this is a coming of old age story about a woman who enters a national baking competition in the UK. And it's light and sweet. And it's just what I needed after coming off of a few really, really long reads. I just needed something quick and fun. Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame comes out January 30th. That one looks so cute. I can't wait to get to it. Yeah. What are you reading right now? I'm reading All We Were Promised by Ashton Lattimore. It comes out in April and it's set in Philadelphia in the 1830s and it's centered around three black women. One of them is from a wealthy Pennsylvania household. One is an escaped slave and one works in service and they come together and it's just what happens. And so far, it's fabulous. I'm really, really enjoying it. That one looks awesome. So now we're going to dive into our books. And before we do that, I was reflecting a little bit on mine, just looking back and thinking about last year and how we talked about, at least for me, I think you had the same thing happening, but that the first half of the year really produced a lot of our favorites. Was that the case for you last year too? It was. Yeah. January, February, March were a lot of big wins for me. Me too. And so I was curious to see what would happen this year because I always talk about how the fall is quieter, but I was amazed to see when I counted my 15 titles that I had eight from the first half of the year and seven from the second half. Yeah, the last year, like you mentioned, it was really heavily weighted my favorites towards the front of the year. But this time, the third quarter, so July, August, September, really had some fantastic reads for me and ones that just really stuck out. I think that's so interesting. And when you really enjoy early reads, the reads that are first part of the year, I always think, okay, if I am still saying they're on the top of my list, that's amazing because often I've read them in the year prior. Like a lot of the January through March reads of 2023, I read in fall of 2022. So if I'm still a year later thinking, oh, I loved those books, then I must really love them. And so I just thought it was interesting, one, to see what came to the top and two, how much more balanced this year was. And then I had a book in every month, but June and December. Oh, interesting. Okay. I didn't have a January book this year, but I think um, besides January and December, it was really well spread out. Yeah. So I thought it was kind of fun to see that. And the other thing that I noticed as I was going through them was, and I already knew this and I talk about it a lot, but it really came through or shown through in my picks was how much I enjoy a strong sense of place. So many of my books, that was one of the things that really resonated with me was feeling like I had been transported somewhere else and how vivid the author brought that particular place to life. My theme was similar this year. I really wanted an escape. And so that could look differently from book to book, but it came across a lot of, not necessarily in a strong sense of place, but a really intriguing plot that just pulled me out of my day to day and took me somewhere else. And I think that is just a reflection on the season of life that I'm in. I'm home a lot with my three little boys. And it's just nice to like pretend that I'm somewhere else instead of my kitchen, you know, mopping the floor for the millionth time. (laughs) (laughs) Picking up all the little toys. Exactly. Yeah. So I think just those books that had a strong plot that kept me engaged really were my standouts this year. It's so interesting to look back on that and just try to make sense of it. And the other thing was, I didn't feel like I read as much historical fiction as I normally do, because I mean, I'm kind of known for that. And and people are reaching out to me all the time. They're like, you know, I know you focus on historical fiction. And I felt like I hadn't as much this year, but seven of my 15 are historical fiction. So clearly, the ones I did focus on, I really liked. So maybe that's just what happened was that I was just choosier in what I decided to read. But the ones that I did read, I loved. I think that's right for me, too. So the other thing that I noticed about my reading is last year, I had a lot more literary books or even like some quiet books. And this year, I think my picks were overall less literary and more plot forward. I don't have any just like quiet, beautiful books, which last year that really was something that was sticking with me, but not this year. (laughs) It's just so captivating to see those trends because they clearly differ year to year. And then you think, is it what's being published? Is it what I'm drawn to? Is it my stage of life? It's just kind of interesting over time to look at it, think about it, engage with it. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. And doing these recaps really helps me hone in on those sorts of things. I agree. 
So we each have 15 titles. We overlapped with five. So we're going to do what we have started doing in recent times, which is talking about our overlaps together first, and then talk about our 10 separate. So I did not have a favorite of the year. Some years I do, some years I don't. This year I did not, but you did. So you're going to start with that book and then we'll get going. And we gave an award to each title. So we're going to also mention the award. I don't know how you can go through the year and not pick your favorite. Like, I'm like, come on, Cindy, pick one. Just pick one. <laughs> I know. You kept reaching out. Are you sure you don't have a favorite? I'm like, I just can't settle on one. I That happens to me. Some years I have, it. like last year, the Jillian and McAllister was a clear favorite. But this year I just was like, but I love them all. <laughs> okay, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. But <laughs> I'll work very hard to have a favorite next year. <laughs> Perfect. I do have a favorite. And this was actually my first 2023 release that I read. And I read it last December in 2022. And at that time, I predicted it would be my favorite book of the year. And I was right. And that book is Go as a River by Shelley Reed. And it came out February 28th. So if there was ever a book written that just captured the whole entire essence of what I love about reading and fiction, it would be Go as a River. It's a debut by Shelley Reed, and I think it's truly a modern classic in the making. The story follows Victoria, and she's a 17-year-old girl living in this small Colorado town in the 1950s. And tragically, she loses her mother, and so her days are spent caring for this household of these men that are selfish and callous, and she works the peach farm that her family has owned for generations. Victoria becomes enamored with a boy, and we get this steady sense of foreboding, and tragedy ensues. But then we follow Victoria over the course of 20 years as she navigates unexpected friendships and this deep-rooted sorrow, and we also watch as she gives herself grace for the girl that she once was. The writing here is stunning. After I read the first chapter, I immediately got out my sticker tabs to annotate because I just thought that every sentence was a work of art. You should see my book. I don't typically do this, but it's tabbed to the absolute max. (laughs) And I knew straight away from the prologue that I had something really special on my hands. And from the writing, you can just tell that Shelley has this deep appreciation for nature in the way that she describes the Colorado setting and just the, the themes that she encourages readers to think about. We hosted Shelley for chapters and chats and her reverence for the natural world was so evident there too. She's a delightful person and it was so fun to read this book so far in advance before it came out because I knew that she was just sitting on a gold mine and I was just waiting for it to come into the world. And it's been great to see the amazing reception that this book has had. So overall, I loved the themes of motherhood, sacrifices, establishing your identity, and then thinking about what makes a home. Everything was just so timeless. So if you're looking for a striking story that has a top book of the year, it factor, Let Go as a River by Shelley Reed, Sweep You Away. I loved this book so much as well. And the award I gave it was Historical Fiction Standout because I did feel like, even though I read so many wonderful historical fiction books this year, that it definitely was the best. The sense of place, her tie to nature, as you mentioned, motherhood, just all of the different things that she grapples with in the story, I thought were so well done. I also loved that it was based on something that had actually happened. Mm -hmm. Talks about a town, Iola, Colorado, which ended up being flooded in real life and then how she approached that in the story. And I just felt that there was so much to it. There's a lot of depth in that story. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you put this one on my radar. Last year, you read it and you're like, okay, you've got to read this. You're going to love it. And you knew me. I I did. (laughs) It's so good. And it's one of those that I continue to see regularly on Bookstagram. You know, most books have their kind of life the first couple of months and everybody's talking about them. And then some books kind of slowly continue on. Some appear all the time. But I feel like this one just shows up regularly. And I looked it up on Goodreads and it has almost 33,000 ratings, which for a debut is amazing. And it sits at a 4.32 which is incredible. So I was just very happy to see that. Yeah, I thought that was amazing. That's great. I love to hear that. So the next book that we overlapped on, I gave Most Likely to Reread, and that is The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise by Colleen Oakley. And it came out in March. This not-to-be-missed gem stars 21-year-old college dropout Tanner Quimby, 
and 84-year-old Louise Wilt, who are thrown together when Louise's family decides she needs a live-in caregiver and Tanner's family decides she needs to quit feeling sorry for herself. The two purposely ignore each other initially, but Tanner begins to realize that something is amiss. The news keeps airing updates to an old jewelry heist, and the wanted suspect looks a lot like Louise. In addition, Louise keeps her garden shed under heavy lock and key. Then one evening, Louise wakes Tanner up and insists that they leave immediately in a car Tanner didn't even know existed and head across the country. Over the course of their adventure, the two women begin to develop a friendship. Interspersed with the regular narrative are hilarious text exchanges between Louise's children, interviews with the FBI, and more, which add a highly entertaining element to an already engaging story. This book is delightful from page one and combined with the stellar ending makes this one of the best books that I have read this year. I wish I could personally take a road trip with Tanner and Louise. My Patreon group read this as part of my early reads program, and it was a huge hit with the group. She told all of these great stories about different snippets of the book and how they were pulled from her real life. And then I also hosted her in October for the fifth anniversary of my literary salon. And the group there also really loved listening to her. And I've had great feedback on the book. I love intergenerational relationships. That's just one of my favorite themes. And this one does it so well. And they both balance each other. Tanner helps Louise. Louise helps Tanner. It's not like one is benefiting from the relationship and one isn't. And then the story just went in a different direction than I thought it was going to. And I always enjoy that. And that's The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise by Colleen Oakley. This was one of my top favorites as well. I gave it the award, the best book to recommend to anyone, because I do think most readers can pick this up and just have a ball with it. It is a delightful read. And like you said, the intergenerational friendships really sealed the deal for me. I love when that's portrayed in fiction. And I think that we need more of that in our world because we do have different perspectives and different things to offer. I agree. And I agree with your award because... I was telling people at the salon that this is one of those books that I have recommended to countless people. And I haven't had a single person come back and say, oh, that didn't really work for me. And sometimes that does happen with other books. People come back and be like, I liked it. I didn't love it. But literally every person has been like, I loved that book and I passed it on to a friend. So I think that your award is right, that it's the most likely to recommend to a friend as well. So good. So good. The next book up for me is Most Likely to Keep You Up Past Bedtime, and that is Drowning by T.J. Newman, and it came out on May 30th. This book was the fastest paced thrill ride, and it read like a blockbuster movie. Drowning tells the story of the harrowing rescue of Flight 1421 as it plunges into the Pacific Ocean minutes after takeoff from Hawaii. And as it goes into the ocean, it's resting very precariously on this underwater ledge. Is that how you would describe it? Definitely. Will Kent and his young daughter are stuck inside the flooding plane with their fates held in the hands of an elite rescue team led by Will's soon-to-be ex-wife. I was completely and utterly immersed from the technical aspects of how this underwater rescue could be executed to the deeply human emotions in this life or death scenario. It was such a gripping story, but also so full of heart. And I just really loved the characters. So I listened to the audiobook and I found myself sitting in the grocery store parking lot, just not moving, completely idle and white knuckling the steering wheel, like so tense. I feel like I was sore the next day. My arms were just gripping it because this was such a tense read and I had to know what was going to happen. TJ Newman's background as a flight attendant also adds this level of authenticity and expertise to this completely bingeable thriller. And that was Drowning by T.J. Newman. So I actually gave this one most likely to recommend to a friend because I have recommended it to so many people. And this is another where everybody comes back and was like, oh my gosh, that book. Thank you so much for recommending it. It was such a page turner. I couldn't put it down. Yeah, I think it's the ultimate beach read. Or if you're really brave, you could read it on the plane. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not that brave. But what I liked about it and what I have told people who aren't great flyers is that you really don't get involved much in that. I mean, the crash, there's not even an explanation for the crash. It happens at the very beginning of the book. Right. And then everything else that happens after that is just really related to them being stuck in the plane. But it's one of those stories that you think, okay, good. They got past that. Now all is well. And then the next thing happens. And it's just, Mm -hmm. it's very, the characters are well developed. The story is really well drawn. It's very well plotted. I just thought it's definitely a standout thriller. 
Yeah, I'm curious what TJ Newman will do next because she's got these two books now, Falling and Drowning. The covers look almost identical. And I'm like, are you just a plain author now? Do you Are you a plain girl? Is that it? Or do you, are you going to branch out and do something else? I'm curious to see what she'll do. Yes, because you think there's only so many stories that can be set on a plane, but you know, right. maybe she'll come up with a whole series of them. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, the next one that we share, I gave best glimpse into a particular time period, and it's The River We Remember by William Kent Kruger, and it came out in September. With his signature writing style and insightful portrayal of both the natural world and the people who reside there, William Kent Kruger pens another gem that will stay with me for a very long time. It's the late 1950s, and the fictional town of Jewell, Minnesota, is commemorating Memorial Day to honor those who died in the country's various wars. Wealthy resident Jimmy Quinn's bullet-filled body is found floating half-naked in the Alabaster River, and Sheriff Brody Dern, a highly decorated veteran who bears both internal and external scars from World War II, is tasked with solving Quinn's murder. Around town, rumors fly that the murderer is Noah Bluestone, a Native American veteran who has recently come home to Jewel with a Japanese wife. The River We Remember portrays small-town life following war and tragedy, as well as the many ways that people seek to heal from both. This beautiful depiction of mid-century American life will resonate with anyone who loves a well-told story. One thing that really stuck out to me was that people often think about World War II and the years following World War II as a time where everybody was on the same page, everybody came together, shared the same views, but that's not the case at all. There's really no time period like that. And it's easy to look back with rose-colored glasses. And so I liked this portrayal of a time right after World War II, where people are trying to recover. There are a lot of damaged people, both the people who went and fought and the people who waited for those who went and fought. And there's a lot of different things happening and people sharing different views. And so I just felt he did a wonderful job of bringing the 1950s to life as it actually was versus how we sometimes reflect upon it. He just draws you into his stories and makes you care so much about the characters. He has a true gift. And that is The River We Remember by William Kent Kruger. I love the way that you described that. I gave it the award, the best coming of age story, because as in his other books, Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land, he just writes the heart of young boys kind of on the precipice of becoming men so well and how these formative times really change the trajectory of their life and change their perspective. And I just... I think he writes characters having these moments so well. I agree. Okay, next up for me is the most unique story structure. And that award goes to Murder in the Family by Kara Hunter. And this came out September 19th. This is a highly entertaining mystery, really unlike anything else I've ever read and was a standout for me this year. I was wholeheartedly invested in this story of old money, revenge, and deceit. So the story is about a team of experts, and they're brought together to solve this cold case murder of a man on an extravagant London estate. And each of the experts that they bring together has their own secrets and motivations that are slowly revealed. This is a multimedia story that reads like a bingeable Netflix documentary and includes maps, resumes, voicemails, texts, emails, and photos that bring the story to life. For this reason, I think you're going to want a hard copy in front of you instead of the audiobook. I thought this book was expertly plotted and perfectly paced. Cara Hunter delivers just enough clues that allow readers to try and, at least in my case, mostly fail to solve this layered mystery. The twist started really early, and then you have these short chapters, and they just keep coming until the very last page. This is a fictional story, but then there are also true crime cases woven in. So I just went down many Google rabbit holes looking to see what was true and what was fictional. And that was Murder in the Family by Kara Hunter. And I gave it a similar award, most unique format. So I guess they're probably yeah. about the same. But I just loved this format. I love unique formats. I mean, I'm always drawn into stories that are told in different manners and telling this in the form of a Netflix script, I thought was just so ingenious. Like I loved it. And one of the things I did when we were in London was go bookstore to bookstore, picking up her backlist because it hasn't been published in the US yet. It will be in 2024. I think they're starting to put her books out. But because when I interviewed her, she talked about how much she loves the multimedia format. I was like, okay, I've got to get her other books. So I grabbed as many as I could find while I was there. 
Oh, that's great. I actually just ordered Close to Home, which I'm not, I think that's a UK release as well. But that is one, I think it's the start of a series and I'm really excited to get to that. That's exactly right. And I bought that one. It is the start to a series. And I bought a couple more in the series and then I bought one other. So I just literally every single bookstore, I beeline to the mystery, which they call crime there and found Hunter and grabbed what they had. (laughs) I was like, I can't wait for them to release here. (laughs) That's perfect. But I loved that book. I thought it was so well done. And my in-person book club just read it in November and everyone loved it. It was really well received. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just a general crowd pleaser, I think. I agree. So now we're going to go to the ones that are on each of our lists, our top favorites, but that we didn't overlap on. So my first one is Most Unsettling, and it's Better the Blood by Michael Bennett. And it came out in January. Hannah Westerman is a tenacious Maori detective juggling single motherhood and the pressure of her career in Auckland's Central Investigation Branch. When she's led to a crime scene by a mysterious video, she discovers a man hanging in a secret room. As Hannah and her team work to track down the killer, other details lead her to think that they are searching for New Zealand's first serial killer. With little to go on, Hannah must use all of her experience as a police officer to try and find a motive to these apparently unrelated murders. What she eventually discovers is a link to a historic crime that leads back to the brutal colonization of New Zealand. When the pursuit becomes frighteningly personal, Hannah realizes that her heritage and knowledge are their only keys to finding the killer. Bennett, the author, who is a Maori, writes an absolutely thrilling and riveting novel, which is a start to a new series. I could not stop reading it once I started it. The book is set in contemporary New Zealand, as I mentioned, but it's rooted deeply within the Maori history and Better the Blood highlights how past trauma bleeds into the present. The book captivated me while also throwing a light on New Zealand's dark and troubled history. The stellar characterization of Hana is a major highlight. She is damaged by her experience of being a Maori police officer, who has been used and manipulated based on who she is, and she is merely the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the pain, sorrow, and suffering endured by the Maori community, past and present. I am still thinking about this book many months later. I've been keeping my eye out for book two, but so far I haven't seen anything on it, but I'm eagerly awaiting it. And that is Better the Blood by Michael Bennett. Okay, I just ordered that from Pango, the used book site, um, while we were talking because I forgot that you had mentioned that one earlier in the year and it sounds so good. It really is so good. And it's just something I knew so little about. And so that was another thing I really loved. It's very well plotted and it's a very crafty mystery, but also there's all of this history about New Zealand and the Maori people. And I just thought it was very well done. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. The next book for me, I gave the award Most Darkly Lyrical, and that's On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel, and it came out February 14th. So this is one of the darkest yet most beautifully written stories that I've ever read. But please, please hear me when I say this, that it is not a book for everyone. It's a fictional story, but it is based on the true crime story of the Chillicothe murders. And this is a small town in Ohio, which is crippled by opioid addiction. While local authorities turned a blind eye, many women with addiction and involved in prostitution went missing or were found dead in the river. And no major investigations ever took place because of who the victims were in society. It was just like they were completely invisible. So Tiffany McDaniel takes these true crimes and she fictionalizes them in On the Savage Side. The story follows twin sisters, Ark and Daffy. I I despise those names, but (laughs) that's the worst part about the book. So stick with me. Um, They experience a really bleak childhood and young adulthood. And the book is more about these characters than it is about solving the mystery of the missing girls. The rawness and heartbreak of addiction is on full display here. I was so invested in the girls' struggles, and I just couldn't tear myself away from the brokenness that they experienced. Tiffany McDaniel is also from Appalachia herself, Southern Ohio, and she makes the point that these girls were somebody's beloved daughter and worthy of not only a proper investigation into their disappearance, but love and compassion. And she gives the girls back the humanity that was stripped from them. As with her debut novel, Betty, Tiffany McDaniel creates this stark juxtaposition of really deeply disturbing content paired with the most lyrical, poetic prose. Some of her sentences, I feel like, could just be in a frame on the wall. 
I was simultaneously in awe of her beautiful writing, but then also extremely unsettled by so many aspects of this really bleak story. You can pretty much name any trigger warning and you'll likely find it here on the pages. But On the Savage Side raises important questions about those who are society values and the vulnerable people that are overlooked. In the book, too, I wanted to mention there are some really interesting visual details, some multimedia things, again, that are included. So I definitely recommend picking up a physical copy over the audio. And that was On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel. I have heard such great things about that. But as you and I have discussed in the past and you mentioned again today, it's way too dark for me. Yeah, this one, not for you. (laughs) Yeah, and that's okay. (laughs) So my next one is The Best Book to Get Lost In, and it's Time's Undoing by Cheryl A. Head. And this one came out in February. This dual timeline story focuses on 1929 Birmingham, known then as Magic City, during its heyday as a steel supplier. Master carpenter Robert Lee Harrington relocates his family to Birmingham for a job, and with its booming economy, the city is a great place to live, except for the fact that the Klan is very active there. In the 2019 timeline, Robert's great-granddaughter, Megan McKenzie, the youngest reporter at the Detroit Free Press, becomes interested in his murder and why his body was never found. So she travels to Birmingham to investigate, stirring up secrets that have long been buried and that someone does not want uncovered. The story is inspired by true events, and it is both a passionate tale of one woman's quest for the truth behind the racially motivated trauma that has haunted her family for generations, and as newfound friends and supporters in Birmingham rally around Megan's search, the uplifting story of a community coming together to fight for change. I read this book in two days and found it so compelling. I loved the strong sense of place for both Detroit and Birmingham, the characters, and the fact that it was loosely based on Cheryl's family history. I didn't know much about Birmingham in the 1920s, and I don't know that much about Detroit. And the thing that is really interesting is that she feels the cities are pretty similar and that there are a lot of parallels. Uh, Cheryl lives in Detroit or used to live in Detroit and feels very comfortable writing about it and then did all this research on Birmingham based on her great grandfather's disappearance. So I just learned a ton, really enjoyed it, loved the way the story developed and how it ended. And that's Time's Undoing by Cheryl A. Head. I love that she kind of dipped back into her own family history and was able to tell a really captivating story. That sounds so good. I agree. And really touched on so many timely issues, which I always enjoy. As do I. I'm going to take a hard left turn here from my last book and go to something a little bit lighter. The Most Likely to Make You Laugh Award goes to Late Bloomers by Deepa Varadarajan. And it came out May 2nd. This is a delightfully dramatic debut novel about an Indian American family in the aftermath of the parents ending their 36-year arranged marriage. The story does a really great job of highlighting the unique cultural challenges of children with immigrant parents in a candid way. I was rooting for these characters so much as they navigated intergenerational cultural differences, they found new beginnings, and pursued their own version of the American dream. It's a messy family drama that is so full of heart. I typically don't laugh out loud while reading books, but the antics of some of these characters just did get a few chuckles out of me. The audiobook was fantastic as it had a full cast narration. The humor and the accents and each character's distinct personality really came through and enhanced the listening experience for me. This was an own voices debut that I loved and I just can't wait to read more from this author. That was Late Bloomers by Deepa Varadarajan. I've heard such great things about that one. It sounds really entertaining. It sure is. What's next for you? Well, mine is also most likely to make you laugh. How funny is that? (laughs) And mine is Vera Wong's Unsolicited Guide for Murderers by Jesse Q. Satanto, and it came out in March. Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers is a laugh-out-loud mystery set in San Francisco's Chinatown. When 60-year-old Vera Wong finds a dead body in her tea shop, she calls the police, but not until after taking a flash drive from the dead man's hand and hiding it. Frustrated with the police's investigative work, it looks nothing like how the cops solve cases on TV. She decides to do a little detective work herself, much to the police's chagrin. I loved Vera. She is outspoken and over the top at times, but means well as she plows forward, dragging everyone else with her. Corralling the four individuals who stop by the shop, Following the body's discovery, Vera works to crack the case while inadvertently making new friends with the people she is sure are suspects. 
filled with humor and hijinks. This one is a delight from beginning to end. I loved how she brought a group of struggling individuals together. The found family theme is almost always a hit with me. There is just something about that theme that really resonates with me. And this is the perfect example of a book with that theme that plays out very well. And that is Vera Wong's Unsolicited Guide for Murders by Jesse Q. Satanto. This just missed my list and I kept it off knowing that you were for sure going to have it on there because I adored it too. And the thing, like you said, that stuck out to me the most was the found family. It just gets me every time. And Vera herself, like she's just a hoot. She is watching the police investigate the crime at her shop and she's like, they're not doing it like they do it on TV. They should be doing this and they should be doing that and just heads out to take care of it herself. I just loved that. Mm -hmm. I did too. Next up for me is most likely to feel like a conversation with a friend. And that is, it was an ugly couch anyway and other thoughts on moving forward by Elizabeth Passarella and it came out May 2nd. This is the second essay collection by Elizabeth Passarella that I have given five stars to. I loved her first book, Good Apple, and her second book did not disappoint. The common threads throughout the essays are this beloved old couch long past its prime and the emotional roller coaster of a move into a former hoarder's apartment. I love the way that Elizabeth explores the nuances of motherhood and life in New York City and then moving forward in the aftermath of grief and change. She strikes this perfect balance of humor and heart and doesn't take herself too seriously. Elizabeth is really candid and vulnerable in the way that she shares about her life. And I found her stories of imperfection so relatable. I love laughing at myself. I feel like if I didn't laugh at myself on a daily basis, life would be a lot, <laughs> a lot more disappointing. And so I think she, she carries that same attitude. And I just really resonated with that. I had the chance to do an Instagram live with Elizabeth and got to interview her. And it did feel just like chatting with an old friend. Like I felt like we knew each other so well because I had read her book. And it's just a warm book and lighthearted, but again, something that will really, really touch you too. That was, it was an ugly couch anyway, and other thoughts on moving forward by Elizabeth Passarella. I adored this book and I left it off my list because I knew it was going to be on yours. So I thought, (laughs) okay, we can talk about it anyway when I was trying to get to 15. And I liked Good Apple a lot, but I loved this one. And I listened Mm -hmm. to it as well, actually, right after I'd had surgery. And I couldn't get settled and I couldn't find anything that was working. Like I kept trying different audiobooks. And then I put this one on and it worked and it held. And I Aww. listened to the whole thing in one sitting while I was laying there recuperating. And what I really loved about the audiobook, as well as the fact that she narrates it, so you do feel like you're listening to a friend. Then she has an interview with the person whose apartment that she yes. ended up getting. So I thought that was so neat. Like the audiobook had an extra bonus. And then I did a Patreon interview with her for my Lit Lovers group where we do a spoiler-filled conversation. And she talked about the essay that didn't make the book and some other cool things about the marketing of the story. I just loved it. She's delightful and that book is delightful. Yeah, so true. So true. What's next for you? So mine is Best Book Club Discussion and it's Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano, which came out in March. With Little Women as a jumping off point, Napolitano writes an incredibly moving and engrossing family drama centered around the four Padovano sisters and William Waters, the lonely individual with a sad past who becomes intertwined with them and inadvertently threatens to rupture their bond. Each sister has a distinct personality, some much more likable than others, but it is William who truly steals the show. Growing up, his parents treated him so poorly, causing him to struggle with mental health issues. But as a story progresses, he finds the inner strength with the help of some loyal friends to find his path, and to learn to accept honest and real love into his life. Hello Beautiful is storytelling at its finest, and it portrays life, loss, and love in all its different forms, and the beauty and price of love, and the extraordinary power of human connection. This truly is a must-read. Oprah selected it as her 100th book club pick, and I believe that is really well-deserved. The book did start a little slow for me, but once I got into it, I thought it was incredibly compelling. I went to Northwestern, so I love that the book was set there and in Chicago, and I truly loved William and his friends who always had his back. The portrayal of this group of men who majorly show up for each other is something that you don't often see in fiction, and that part of the story really touched my heart. But I will say, have some tissues ready for this one because it really will pull at your heartstrings, and that is Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. 
That was such a great story too. And hearing your voice as you talk about it, I'm like, Cindy, this might be your favorite. I don't know. I just hear like a little lilt in your voice. Like, I don't know. I just remember how much you loved it when it first came out. And I really did too. And you're right. Your heart just, you know, goes out to William and as he tries to find himself despite his upbringing. Exactly. And his relationship with the sisters and their relationships with each other. I just loved it. Yeah, it was so good. Well, I'm taking a dark turn, (laughs) as I always seem to do. The most tense award goes to The Quiet Tenet by Claymont's Michelin, and it came out June 20th. The story follows Aidan Thomas, who is this handsome father and a pillar of the community, and he also happens to be a serial killer. And our main narrator is an unnamed woman who was kidnapped by Aiden and imprisoned in a shed for five years. But then Aiden is forced to sell his house and he moves the woman into the new home that he shares with his young daughter under the guise of his woman and captive being his new roommate. The Quiet Tenant strikes this really great balance of page turning plot with fascinating characters. We hear from Aiden's daughter, his love interest, and his victims, who each offer really different perspectives on the man Aiden is. Human captivity is obviously a dark topic, but the story isn't gratuitous with descriptions of murder, abuse, or gore. Those are only alluded to off the page, which I appreciated. The novel is less about the specifics of what happened to women at the hands of a serial killer and more about just the spirit inside the victims that nobody can take away. The tension in this story is simply unrivaled. I could not put this book down. I just had to know what was happening. And it was a quiet book. Some people had said the pace was a little slow for them. It's more of a slow burn suspense character study than it is this really plot driven story. But it worked well for me. That was The Quiet Tenet by Claymont's Michelin. Again, another one that is too dark for me, but I have heard nothing but wonderful things about it. I think it's interesting to learn more about myself in terms of like human captivity seems to be like a trigger for me. Like I don't really want to read about people being in captivity. And it's kind of curious. I'm like, I wonder why that's so triggering for me. But it just is one of those things that I tend to shy away from those stories. I know. And I feel like I'm drawn to them. And I'm like, what is it about that? I'm like, (laughs) Maybe I just need to know. I I think I run anxious as a person. And I'm like, maybe I just need to know, like, how would I get out? (laughs) Exactly. Give you some ideas. Yeah. But the other thing that you mentioned is how much it focuses on his victims and really their stories. And I think that's interesting because there seem to be more and more stories about serial killers that are really told more about the women. And I think that's an interesting trend. I think so, too. Really flipping the script and letting the women speak their piece. Have a voice. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here, Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. So my next one, Strongest Sense of Place, which you know must mean it really does have one because I think so many of these stories do. And it is Homecoming by Kate Morton, which came out in April. I am a huge Kate Morton fan. I have read every one of her books and really enjoyed them all. 
And this one was absolutely no exception. And this one is her first book set in Australia. And she's actually Australian. She lives in Australia. In the South Australian town of Tambala, a delivery driver discovers a dead body on Christmas Eve, 1959, on the grounds of a magnificent mansion. An investigation ensues surrounding the shocking and mysterious death. Six decades later, Jess, an unemployed journalist in London, is called back to Australia because her grandmother, Nora, has been sent to the hospital. While staying at her grandmother's house, she stumbles across a book called The Turner Family Tragedy of Christmas Eve, 1959, that chronicles the police investigation into a long-ago murder. When she delves into the book, she is stunned to discover that her family may have a connection to the decades-old killing. Morton's prose is stunning, and the book within a book made for such a compelling read. She brings Australia vividly to life. I truly felt transported there, and I was sad to leave the setting and the characters when the book was over. I also really liked how the story resolved. I was surprised by how it ended because I figured it was going in one direction and it resolved in a different direction, which is always such a pleasant surprise for me. I love when that happens. But she's just one of those authors that can really create a setting and you just feel like you are right there with whatever she is describing. Now, some people have said it was kind of slow. So I think if you are not as into character driven stories, then this one may be a little slower for you. But I didn't think so at all. It's big. I think it's over 500 pages. And I just raced through it. I felt that it was so well developed. And I really liked how the two stories came together. And I didn't like one more than the other, which often happens in a story. I really liked the two timelines and reading the Turner family tragedy of Christmas Eve, which is interspersed throughout the novel. So I just give it all the stars. And that is Homecoming by Kate Morton. That's one that I haven't read. I've only read one of her books, but I do love a book within a book premise. And the Australian setting sounds so good. Absolutely. So on the note of Australian, I have an Australian author next. The award is Most Unforgettable Character, and it goes to How to Be Remembered by Michael Thompson. And this came out June 27th. This is a really delightful coming-of-age story that follows Tommy Llewellyn, who is forgotten by the universe each year on his birthday. And we meet Tommy as an infant, and then we follow him into adulthood as he navigates a world where everybody that he meets is bound to forget his very existence. But Tommy's own memories remain intact. I just adored Tommy as he fought to carve out a place for himself in this world that just couldn't remember that he even existed. The story had such a rich cast of characters, and I loved the themes of identity and legacy. This book really snuck by me this summer. I missed it on my summer reading guide, um, but I'm so glad that I picked it up. Source Books, the publisher, connected me with Michael Thompson and he did a story takeover on Instagram on my page where he answered questions that readers submitted to him about how to be remembered. And he was just such a genuinely warm person and so wonderful to meet with. And he recommended a few other Australian authors to me, one which ended up making my best of the year list too, which I'll talk about. So if you love the found family trope and a really big hearted story, be sure to pick up How to Be Remembered by Australian debut author Michael Thompson. This one just arrived here not that long ago, and then you were talking about it. So I need to bump it up my list. I hope to get to it before the end of 2023. It's a quick read and it's really sweet. I think you'll like it. And I can't wait to hear about some of the other Australian authors that he recommended. Yes, yes. So my next one is Most Perfectly Plotted. And it's The Bitter Past by Bruce Borges, and it came out in July. After retiring from an Army Intelligence Division, Porter Beck has returned home to take on the role as Sheriff of Lincoln County, located in the high desert of Nevada, north of Las Vegas. When a retired FBI agent is killed, the normally sleepy area suddenly springs to life as FBI agents arrive in a mystery from 60 years ago when a Russian KGB agent came to pilfer the United States nuclear technology appears to be linked to the recent death. Toggling back and forth in time, The Bitter Past is the first in a new mystery series, and it is an enthralling read. The nuclear testing site storyline, the FBI aspects of the story, and the ending make this an all-around fabulous thriller. I am not too often surprised by twists and turns in a mystery, and this one totally got me. I just love that. It was an incredible ending that made perfect sense, and I didn't see it coming. You can't ask for anything better than that. As I was reading, I couldn't turn the pages fast enough, and I am eagerly awaiting book two in the series, which was just recently announced. It's entitled Shades of Mercy, and it will be out July 16th, 2024. 
so you have plenty of time to get the first installment read. To me, the beauty of this book is that it is such a solid mystery, but there's also this really cool historical aspect. I didn't know a ton about the nuclear testing in Nevada and how much it impacted not only Nevada, but some of the other states surrounding it, how people had no idea. So he was talking about how the debris would land on cars and kids were out there drawing in it. And, you know, they were running around as it came down. And then obviously the length of time that it remained in the air and crops and animals and everything were poisoned and died. So it was horrific. And it took them a while to understand all of this and to move it underground. So it was just interesting to learn some of that history, also the Russian aspect of it, somebody trying to infiltrate our facility on nuclear technology. All of it was just so well done. And that is The Bitter Past by Bruce Borges. I think you're right that it's hard to find a book that can surprise you, but then also not have an ending that feels totally out of left field. And so when you find that, it is a true gem. It really is. And you're thinking, he did such an amazing job. Makes me a little nervous for book two because I loved Uh book one so much, but I'm sure it will be great too. Yeah. Well, I'll be curious to see what you think. Next for me is the Best Book Club Discussion Award. And that goes to One Summer in Savannah by Tara Shelton Harris. And this came out July 4th. This is a really fantastic debut. We hosted Tara for our Chapters and Chats book club. And she shared that she set out to challenge readers about what acts they consider worthy of forgiveness. I think that if you read this story, you will agree that she certainly achieved that goal. The story follows Sarah, who was raped by a man when she was 18 years old, and her perpetrator was from this prominent family in Georgia, and he was sentenced to jail, and he didn't know anything about the baby that she conceived as a result of the assault. Georgia has a law that biological parents of children born from sexual assault actually have parental rights, which seems crazy to me, but this is, Tara did say this is true. So Sarah flees to Maine seeking safety for her child because there the laws prohibit parental rights for circumstances of rape. She returns to Savannah, Georgia, eight years later to be with her dying father. And then when she's back in Savannah, she meets unexpected people who challenge what she believes about forgiveness and grief. With a Southern setting and a bookstore to adore, there's so much to appreciate about this novel. There's also a really unique love story that is as thought-provoking as it is emotional and maybe a little controversial. The writing is literally poetic because poems are woven throughout the dialogue. And I just thought the story flowed seamlessly and explored so many timely themes like consent, the court of public opinion, and new beginnings. There is so much to unpack with this story. And because of that, we had such an amazing book club chat. It's a redemptive and heartfelt story and so worthy of a read. And that was One Summer in Savannah by Tara Shelton Harris. And she has a new book coming out this next year. I'm really looking forward to that one. She does. I can't wait to read it. Me too. So my next is Best Family Saga, and it's The Connellys of County Down by Tracy Lang, which came out in August. Fans of Lang's debut, We Are the Brennans, will revel in her standalone sophomore outing, The Connellys of County Down. I am always a little anxious to read the second book by an author when I loved their first, but I like this one even more, so all was well. The three Connolly siblings, Geraldine, Eddie, and Tara, lost their parents when they were young, and life has not been easy for them since. When Tara is released from prison and returns home to live with Geraldine and Eddie, she upsets the uneasy equilibrium that her siblings had reached while she was gone. Things aren't quite what they seem, and as secrets are slowly unveiled, the siblings struggle to keep their family together. I had not read a book where someone was getting out of prison and all that that entailed, so that part of the book was particularly intriguing to me. I thoroughly enjoyed the sibling dynamics, and I'm a huge fan of both her writing and her characters. This is a great choice for readers who love family dramas and solid character development. I also loved this side storyline because Tara is out of prison, so she has trouble finding a job, and she ends up hired with these two teenagers who are creating video games, and she's their graphic designer. And that aspect of the story was just so much fun, and how it all plays out, and how she interacts with both them and their families. I just thought that was really clever and fun, and I really did enjoy the prison aspect of the story because that was just something I hadn't contemplated a lot of that before. And it was interesting to see how it played out. And then I also loved learning more about the siblings. 
There's a romance in here, which is also a little controversial. And so it was interesting to talk with Tracy about that when I interviewed her, that some people are okay with it, some people aren't. So I thought that that was interesting as well. And that is The Connellys of County Down by Tracy Lang. She is such a fantastic author. I love that she did not have a sophomore slump. Her second book was so well received. And that is one of my favorite covers of the year. It's so pretty. It is so pretty. Okay, next for me, I have the most mysterious storyline. And that goes to Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. And it came out July 18th. This book made my end of the year list because it's a quirky and dark mystery, which is a strange combination, but Strange Sally pulled it off. Sally Diamond is reclusive and quirky, possibly neurodivergent, although it's never mentioned, but she takes her father's request to, quote, throw him out with the rubbish when he dies, quite literally. So she does this and her actions ignite this huge media storm and put her into a spotlight that she is entirely unprepared for. And while she's in this unwanted 15 minutes of fame, this opens a door to her past trauma. And I think it's best to go in blind to this story, but you should be aware that there are many, many trigger warnings, so please check those. But what's done really well are these characters that capture your heart And they offer a little bit of comic relief that's woven into the story that has many disturbing aspects. I loved the way that mental health and neurodiversity were portrayed respectfully and with great sensitivity. So despite the heavy themes, the story does have some glimmers of hope and readers who enjoy the found family trope will especially appreciate this one. That was Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. And she just won some award in Ireland because she and I follow each other on Instagram and she was posting about it yesterday. Oh, I didn't see that. That's great. Yeah. But I definitely have heard that it is incredibly dark and that there are a lot of trigger warnings. So I just think people, if they're like me, at least need to know that going in. Yep. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. So my next one is best recommendation from a friend. And it was Pamela Klingerhorn when she came on the podcast to talk about upcoming fall reads that she really enjoyed. And this is The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters, and it came out in October. A Mi'kmaq family travels every summer from Nova Scotia to Maine to pick blueberries. And one summer, four-year-old Ruthie goes missing while in Maine, last seen by her six-year-old brother, Joe. Interspersed with their story is Norma's tale of growing up in a wealthy Maine household, overly protected by her parents, with dreams of an earlier life that feel more like memories. The story is not what happened to Ruthie, because we know that she is Norma. Instead, it is a tale of trauma and how two families cope with the aftermath of Ruthie's abduction, as well as how secrets can destroy families. While The Berry Pickers is not a happy story, it is a beautiful and powerful one about grief and tragedy and the lifelong repercussions. I love learning about blueberry picking in Maine, as well as the Mi'kmaq culture, and the sense of place is incredibly strong for both Maine and Nova Scotia. This book will appeal to readers who like character-driven stories, family sagas, and or tales steeped in other cultures or locales. I highly, highly recommend it. And that is The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters. I agree with everything you said. I especially enjoyed Joe, the brother, who was present or should have been present when his sister went missing, and his storyline and how that affected him into adulthood and how that played out. Your heart just really goes to him. So I'm so glad you put this on my radar. I loved it so much and knew that this was going to be on your list too. So I was like, okay, we can't have all the same same reads. So I knew it was on yours. So I left it off, but it's fantastic. And I highly recommend it. It is. And another stunning, stunning cover. I don't think the Mm -hmm. Canadian cover is nearly as pretty, but the US cover is so beautiful. It is. It really is. Okay. Speaking of beautiful covers, that leads me into my next pick. It is the most unique premise, and it is Shark Heart by Emily Haybeck, and it came out August 8th. So this story is one that I never would have picked up. I passed it over when I was preparing for my summer reading guide because it just sounded too out there. But I am so glad that I gave it a second chance because I never knew that the story of a man who turns into a shark <laughs> would touch my heart so much. It was bizarre and it was beautiful, but I loved it so much. The story is told in alternating timelines and follows newlyweds Ren and Lucas as he receives the devastating diagnosis that he will slowly transform into a great white shark. The plot was entirely ludicrous, and I have no idea how it worked, 
but it really, really worked for me. It didn't feel gimmicky because the world that this is set in is it's our exact same world with the exception that conditions like Lucas's exist. So she didn't have to go into how this happened. It was just kind of accepted that, you know, this this can happen to people. This layered story explored the nuances of change, and it was just so much more than I really expected. It was the best surprise this year. It explores the lengths that we go for the people that we love and also touches on how we can grieve the loss of somebody even when they are still physically present. The writing was incredible, the structure was unique, and the themes of love and loss in all its various forms really shined. Emily Hayback took a really bold chance on this premise, and I'm so, so glad that she did. She comes from a theater background, and we hosted her for Chapters and Chats a few months ago, and she was talking about how it made sense for her to structure the story like a play. And I can see that. I can see that. And it was very unique, but she just said, yeah, it was my debut novel, and nobody could tell me I couldn't do it. And so I just went for it, and people seemed to appreciate it, and I really did. This also made for a really awesome book club discussion. Even for people who decided that the book wasn't for them, they still appreciated the discussion that it yielded. So I think there's something to be said about that. Also, I wanted to mention that a few friends of mine did the audiobook, and those were the only people that I've heard who haven't really liked the story. And I just don't see it translating well to audio. So just keep that in mind. But this was an incredible read. I was so pleasantly surprised. And that was Shark Heart by Emily Habeck. I am just fascinated with how she came up with that premise. Yeah, she, I asked her that and she said she had no idea. <laughs> she, wishes she, <laughs> she wishes she could answer it, but she just, you know, she just said like she contemplates a lot about mortality and like our purpose of living and life. And it just came out like that. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things about reading is just stumbling across something like that that's so different. Right, exactly. Yep, that there's no book that can be compared to this. Like there's no comps, nor will there. Exactly. Like it's just, it's its own entity. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah. So my next one is Most Unforgettable Character and it's The Madstone by Elizabeth Crook and it came out in November. The Madstone is a character-driven story in the vein of news of the world and I truly loved every second of it. There is this feeling that I get when I start certain books. I don't even know how to describe it, but I am immediately drawn in and captivated, and I just know that I'm in the midst of something really special and really great. And that is this book. It's just this strong pull that tells me, okay, I'm going to love this one. And literally from page one, that's how I felt about the Madstone. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, I know I've got a gem. This beautifully crafted story is set in 1868 Reconstruction Era Texas, and it's narrated by 19-year-old Benjamin Shreve to a young child taught that he meets on the Texas frontier. Benjamin is recounting the journey that the pair embark on with Tot's mom, Nell, across the state to a distant port. Nell and Tot are on the run from Nell's husband, a dangerous man affiliated with a gang that harasses newly freed Black citizens. The trio, joined by a treasure hunter and a Black Seminole who is a veteran of several wars, make the dangerous journey across the Texas Plains, encountering all manner of hardships and peril. Benjamin's smart, heartfelt, and witty narration make the story, as well as the manner in which Crook brings 1860s Texas vividly to life. She just won the Texas Author of the Year at the Texas Book Festival in the last month, and it is so well-deserved. I can't wait to go back and read her earlier books because I haven't read any of them. And Benjamin, who is the most unforgettable character, as I mentioned, is actually a smaller character in one of her earlier stories. And so the books are not, it's not a sequel. You can read it, they're standalones. You can read it without having read the other. But I can't wait to go back and see what he's like as a younger person in The Witch Way Tree. But do have tissues handy when you read this one because it is heartwarming, but also a little heartbreaking. The other cool thing about this one for me was that I attended a conference in April in San Antonio at a historic hotel called the Manger Hotel. And that hotel features in the Madstone. So when I was reading the book and all of a sudden they're there at the Manger Hotel, I was like, how cool is that? That's actually where I got a copy of the book. And it has the most beautiful cover that Elizabeth's relatives actually participated in 
There are people on horseback, and those are actually her relatives that they brought together to paint this picture that could be on the cover to make sure they had it historically accurate. And that is The Madstone by Elizabeth Crook. Oh, wow. I love your personal connection to that story. And that's one that I haven't seen around a lot, but it sounds so good. It's so good, especially if you like stories that are told kind of in that vein, like he is relaying the story to Tot and it's all being told from his perspective. But I thought it was so well done. There's all these twists and turns, a lot of action, but it is character driven as well. You know, that just got me thinking too. Usually I have a book on my list that just feels like a gut punch or like that makes me want to just sob. And I don't know if I have that this year. So maybe I need to pick up the Madstone. (laughs) Yes, the ending is sad. That's what I need. I need it. Next for me is the best time travel story. And the award goes to The Unmaking of June Farrow. And it came out October 17th. This story was unlike anything I've ever read. And it completely swept me away. I do want to keep things a little bit vague so that you can be swept away too, but here is what I think you should know. Adrienne Young plays with time in a really clever and nostalgic way. The generations of unique feral women will utterly captivate you, and like all great stories, there is the love of a lifetime. The story begins with more questions than answers, and this mystery was beautifully braided throughout these pages. The women in the family have a curse and we meet them in various timelines throughout the story. The book is completely original, but it taps into these age-old themes of sacrifice, womanhood, and the meaning of a life well-lived. The audiobook narrated by Brittany Presley is truly something special, and I would highly recommend the audio, but also the timelines can get a little bit tricky, so it might be nice to have a physical copy on hand or draw out the timeline for your reference as you're listening. This book was such a fun surprise for me because I originally passed it over as um, it was a book of the month club pick. But then I saw that Melody at Books and Chicks and Ivana at Beaches, Books and Bubbles both raved about it. And they typically aren't drawn to like magical realism at all or books like that. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. So I ordered it from book of the month and I completely adored it. I gave it five stars. And Chapters and Chats will be hosting Adrienne Young on January 18th. So you can send me an email at kellyhook.readsbooks at gmail.com or message me on Instagram if you'd like to join us. That was The Unmaking of June Farrow by Adrienne Young. I may have to try that one. You're really selling it. And it got by me too, but it definitely sounds like it might be something I would enjoy. As I was reading it, I thought I, I thought to myself, you know, I think Cindy might like this one. Okay, I'm going to try it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my last book is another one that was definitely neck and neck for my favorite book of the year. And I just read it recently. And I did two awards for it. Best Based on a True Story and Best Book I Didn't Know I Needed. And that's The General and Julia by John Clinch. And this one came out in November. So this is another one of those stories that from page one, I knew I was going to love this book. You know those books that are so well written that you end up rereading passage after passage? You talked about that was Go as a River, where you just feel like, oh my gosh, the sentence, it's just so stunning. And I would go back and read it again and feel like, how did he put all those words together? And they just sound so beautiful. So this book is one of those. And it's another, as I mentioned, that gave me all the feels. Near the end of his life and battling throat cancer, Ulysses S. Grant struggles to complete his memoirs before he passes away in order to leave his family financially sound. He chronicles his love for his family, his role in the Civil War, as well as Lee's surrender, serving as a twice-elected president, losing his entire fortune to a swindler, and his friendship with Samuel Clemens, who ultimately publishes his memoirs. As I was reading, I quickly realized that I didn't know much at all about Grant's life. While the focus is on Grant in this tale, the book also serves as a fascinating glimpse into the Civil War, and Reconstruction era years from a perspective that I have not encountered previously. It's a thought-provoking and stunningly crafted story of Grant's life and legacy from his own perspective, and it will stay with me for a long time. I loved the way that Clinch decided to tell the story. He is in Grant's head as Grant is on medication and struggling with this throat cancer, and he's in the present in terms of when he's alive, but he's constantly reflecting back on things that happened. And as he reflects back, then the next chapter tells the story of what happened during that time period. 
So it toggles back and forth between Grant himself and then the third person telling the things that happened during this time period. Grant had a fascinating life, again, which I knew very little about, and I loved learning more about it. My daughter goes to school in New York City, and we recently walked by his tomb, which is this beautiful mausoleum, not very far from her dorm at all. And so the next time I'm there, I can't wait to go in and actually tour it and and see everything there. It's just so well-crafted, and there are these beautiful trees that are parallel out in front of it with all these benches, and it's just a very, very unique monument to one of our presidents. And I was curious why he was there because I didn't realize he had a connection to New York. And so it was interesting to read this book and learn that he spent his later years in New York City and that that's why it's there. The other nice thing about this one is that I think sometimes historical fiction readers get a little tired of World War II. And I think there are still plenty of World War II stories to be told. I just read one recently that I loved that's coming out in 2024. But this is a really nice break from that. If you love historical fiction and you want to read about another era, this is a great one. And that is The General and Julia by John Clinch. You know, I am somehow related to Ulysses S. Grant. So maybe I should read this one just to, I I know nothing about him. So maybe it would be good for me. Well, I didn't either. The other thing I meant to mention is, you know, Mary Calvey, who's on the CBS News in New York City, and she has a monthly book club, or it's maybe an every other month book club. And she'll pick three books and then everybody votes. Well, this is one of her recent selections. So I voted for it. I'm hoping he is going to win because I think it would make such a great discussion. And when I posted about the book on Instagram, I couldn't believe how many people commented that they were these huge fans of Ulysses S. Grant and they'd read all these books about him. And I was like, wow, like this, that, that post had more traction with people that I don't normally interact with than any post that I have done in years. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. But he really did have a fascinating life. And I, yeah. I, you know, I said it's the best book I didn't know I needed because I was like, well, the cover is really pretty and I don't know much about Grant. I'll try this one. And it was a page turner. I know that sounds like that really wouldn't be the case, but I promise it is so well done. Interesting. Okay. I'm intrigued. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got one more, right? I do. My last book is The Best Love Story of the Year and also My Life. And that is The Last Love Note by Emma Gray, and it came out on November 29th. Sometimes you just need a book that will make you feel the full range of human emotions. And The Last Love Note did that for me. The story delivers laughs amidst the tears and this heaping side of hope. So I do think this is my all-time favorite romance. I, I can't think of another love story that I have really felt so deeply. This debut by Australian author Emma Gray follows Kate Whitaker, who's a young mom who finds herself in the uncharted waters of grief after losing her husband. The story is so vulnerable, it's heartfelt, and it's clearly evident that Emma is writing from a place of personal experience with the tragic loss of her own husband and being a single mom to her own children. Reading The Last Love Note felt like an intimate glimpse into the life of a woman fighting to redefine her future after her best laid plans had been totally stripped away. This is a closed door second chance romance and it ripped my heart to shreds, but then it put it back together again. (laughs) You will fall in love with the coastal Australian setting and the way Kate navigates conflicting yet coexisting emotions. And most of all, how she learns to reimagine these big dreams that weren't entirely lost after all. And that was the last love note by Emma Gray. So I don't know if this is a spoiler, but I would have been interested in reading that one, but for what her husband's disease was. Yes, I can see that. Also, just to note, the way that her husband passes away in the book is different from how her husband passed in her real life. And so she said she wanted to write what she knew, but wanted a little bit of distance and space from that, too. Yeah, it was just too personal. Mm -hmm, Definitely. But I I loved it so much. That's what I've heard. I've been hearing rave things about it. Someday I'll get to it. Yep. Not now, but some point. Yep. Exactly. Well, this was so much fun as always. And I now have some books to add to my list. And I just can't thank you enough, Kelly, for coming on and having these fun book conversations with me. Thank you so much for having me. I always have the the best time chatting. And I definitely added to my end of the year TBR a few that I want to get to before before 2024. The pressure. Uh, I know. (laughs) Hello, 
and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the facts from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy this show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. I hope you'll tune in next time. Anne Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave.